Okay, magandang umaga po muli sa lahat. Ako'y nagpapasalamat sa Panginoon. Nakarating tayo sa uh, 149th lecture. We can consider this as the final full lecture because next week will be more or less uh, half a lecture in just reminding and final word of challenge for us to pursue holiness. So last week, we considered one side of this, and that is if you have truly learned holiness, you will learn that it will lead you to laments. Ikaw ay mananaghoy. Kung ikaw ay talagang natuto ng kabanalan sa mga pinag natin, and the reason for the laments is a simple answer, but one that we have to live with all the days of our lives on earth, and that is remaining sin. So tayo ay patuloy sa pananaghoy para sa ating kasalanan. Pero tingnan natin ang kabila nito, may tagumpay rin sa ating pagtugis ng kabanalan. There are triumphs of holiness. And once again, by going back to our past lessons, I will review two considerations here. Triumphs of holiness are real. Hindi tayo nag na merong tagumpay sa kabanalan. They are real based on two considerations that we studied in the past. The first is the victory of Christ over Satan and sin. So this is something that we have studied in the past. Our victory is not personally gained. Our victory is something that Christ has gained on our behalf. Siya ang nanagumpay. Alang-alang sa atin, ang tagumpay niya kay satanas at sa kasalanan ay tagumpay din natin. Hindi lang siya nagbigay ng halimbawa, parang hindi, hindi lang niya sinabi, etong tagumpay ko, gawin mo rin, gayahin mo ako. Hindi niya ginakundi. Itong tagumpay ko ay ibinilang na sa iyo. Ibinil, kaya't ang isang tunay na mana ng palataya, tagumpay na ng dahil sa tagumpay ni Yeso Cristo. Maliwanag ito sa 1 John 3.8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And there are many passages that we can cite to corroborate that. Hebrews 2.14, even Jesus in the upper room discourse saw the lightning fall from heaven as a reference to Satan. At marami pang iba, kaya hindi lang sa siya ay nagsimula ng managumpay, kundi sa krus pa lang na nagumpay na siya sa kay satanas at sa kasalanan and Christ's victory was won and is present through the cross and resurrection kaya hindi lang sa isang panahon ng kanyang buhay nung siya ay tinukso sa wilderness that is part of it uh, he shows there how Adam failed he triumphed not only that if you will find the quotations he cited sa wilderness temptation, they are all from Deuteronomy, which reminds you of the failures of Israel in the wilderness when they were tempted. But in all those temptations, Jesus was victorious. So both parallel to Adam, parallel to Israel, na nagumpay si Jesus kung saan pumalya si Adan at ang Israel. So the victory of Christ, and now in union with Him, meaning our position is in Christ, not our own, but in union with Him, believers own Christ's victory. Not only that believers have a model of victory, believers own the victory of Jesus Christ. First John 5, 4 and 5 says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes. Hindi lang sinabing hopefully will overcome. But he overcomes the world, and this is the victory to, that overcomes the world, our faith. The moment we believe in Jesus Christ, that victory is already yours, which you can appropriate on a day-to-day -day basis that you confront sin. So, as I've said, parallel to fallen nature in Adam, believers are victorious in Christ. Kagaya rin naman ni Adam, hindi lang nagbigay sa Adam ng isang... Uh, halimbawa paano magkasala at sinusunod lang natin yung kanyang kasalanan kundi yung kasalanan niya ibinilang sa atin kaya tayo guilty and corrupt ay because of Adam's sin in the same way ang position ni Jesus as federal head yung kanyang victory over Satan ay victory din natin and his victory over sin is also our victory now if you have a 
point of view like this, it will show that some overestimate the strength of Satan and sin. Parang sa pagsisimula pa lang nila, sinasabi na nila sa sarili na lang, uh, hindi natin makakaya ito. Wala na tayong tagumpay. Uh, when we look at it as from the perspective of Christ having gained victory over Satan and sin, then we will not overestimate Satan and sin. And what we see here is defeatism, yung diwa ng talunan. Talunan na, hindi pa nag-uumpisa ang laban. Yan o kaya't lumaban ang, oh, sa mga last minutes ng Philippine-China uh, ay sumuko na ang Pilipinas. Wala na, tambak na tayo. Pero hindi sumuko, eh, yun ang, well, don't give in to defeatism. Defeatism already makes you a failure to appreciate the victory of Christ. And then it follows that you will be a failure in your fight against sin. So how do we experience triumph over sin? So nakita natin, meron na tayong victory sa Kanya, but we need to appropriate kailangan nating iangkop sa ating sarili ang kinin ang kanyang tagumpay and I want to show the components of triumph how we experience it because the believer is made holy uh, triumphs may be gained mari tayong makakamit ng tagumpay ngayon pa lamang so we will look at this in two ways victory in this life and then victory after this life so sa dalawang sangkap na yan victory in this life are we going are we experiencing victory now well right in the initial victory in conversion when you are converted you are already uh, a uh, you already gain the victory that is Christ as i've said so right there at the moment of faith you already have victory uh, kumbaga, ipinipilit ni Satanas na huwag kang makonvert, uh, mapigil ka sa pagsampalataya sa Ebanghelyo. And may I just say with a pastoral uh, concern that it may be that some of you who still are restraining from coming to Christ even though you understand the gospel but you're not coming to Christ you're not casting yourself upon Christ it may be that the devil is having his victory over you and the way to gain victory over him is cast yourself upon Christ and right at that point there is already victory because when we are converted Colossians 1:13 says we are transferred from the realm of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. So, meron agad uh, tagumpay sa kasalanan dahil nasa kaharian na tayo o paghahari na ng Panginoong Heso Kristo. So, conversion is the human side of the prior spiritual regeneration. Madalas niyong marinig yung believe to be born again. It's wrong. Uh, being born again is the work of the Holy Spirit alone. We do not help Him uh, conversion is the human side When we believe and repent That's our response That's our fruit Of the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit But that shows that from the very beginning The Holy Spirit is involved How can you lose if the Holy Spirit Is involved in your life right at the beginning uh, John 1, 12 and 13 tells us As many as believed him Most of the Jews rejected him he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, he, to them he gave the right to be called the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. But then John follows uh, that they were born not of the will of man, but of God. So you see here two, two uh, blessings. One, upon believing, you are adopted. That's called adoption, uh, blessings of salvation. You receive adoption and you are children of God. But there is something that explains that prior. Ayan ang sinasabing ni John, who were. Uh, so, he believed present tense, but who were, the reason why you believe is because you were born of the will of God, not of your own flesh. So, this initial work of the Spirit 
is what leads to sanctification. That's why it is impossible for anyone to claim to have been converted, which should mean a prior regeneration, and then not proceed to sanctification. Yung magsasabi na, save lang ako, pupunta akong langit pag namatay, hanggang doon lang ang kanilang idea ng conversion. I'm going to heaven when I die, but between my conversion and my going to heaven, it's just uh, nothing has changed. And that is impossible because the Spirit is involved from the beginning. Mula pa umpisa ay aktibo na ang banal na Espiritu sa ating pagkakaligtas. Kung kaya, at isa pa rin ay yung component ng repentance. Conversion already has in, an initial repentance from sin. That is why when Paul summarized to the elders of Ephesus in Acts 20, the message he is preaching to sinners it is repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. So beware, because the popular form of evangelism today, probably the form that has led you to your profession of faith, is a decisionistic method. Talas ko nang ipaliwanag yan na dadalhin ka sa formula decision by whatever means, as long as you can say the words, Lord Jesus, I receive you into my heart. And then the soul winner will give you the assurance that you're going to heaven. Now, that decisionistic method weakens the component of repentance. Yung hindi ka nag-deal sa sin. Gusto mo lang pumunta sa langit. Uh, makasigurong hindi impyerno. Eh. Sino, sino bang gusto ng impyerno? So, uh, sinabi ng preacher, etong pagpunta ng langit. Sige, uh, uh, dictated prayer? Sure, I'll follow your dictated prayer. And what happens is they scuttle the component of repentance. Whereas, where there is initial repentance, that repentance possesses the seed of victory over sin. Uh, remember, thesis number one of the 95 Thesis of Martin Luther, Kahit hindi nyo na memorize yung iba, memorize nyo lang itong number one. When our Lord and Master said, repent, He meant that the life of the Christian is daily repentance. So, yung nagsasabi na, oh, reformation is just about faith. No, <laughs> andyan ang repentance. Nakita ni Martin Luther right at the outset, the reason for this purgatory thing and all this false hope is because there is no true repentance. And when there is true repentance, it becomes daily. It's not a once-for-all decision. You repent as a matter of disposition, and that already is the seed of victory over sin. So man-centered conversion roots its response in a false free will. Now let me just make myself clear. I believe in free will in the sense of freedom of choice that is not coerced. Hindi ka pinagtulakan sa conversion na ayaw mo. Uh, ang ginawa mo ay kagustuhan mo, pinili mo, but yung sinasabing free will dito, in reality, is neutral will. And there is no such thing. There is no neutral will suspended between good and evil and can choose any time to be good or to be evil. Every sinner, as far as God's standard is concerned, is evil. Every will is evil, depraved. But again, because of regeneration, that will is quickened to the gospel. Kaya yung nakarut lang sa kanyang free will, he will have no dependence on the spirit. That's why our opposition to the decisionistic method is not a token opposition. It is something that is destroying many souls with false assurance. So, Sa conversion pa lang, meron na tayong victory. Pero bukod pa riyan, uh, there is increasing victory in sanctification. Yes, increasing will mean fluctuation. Uh, Nagpa-fluctuate. But meron yan. And that includes continuing mortification of sins and always going with mortification, which we studied as first section of our <coughs> series, a cultivation of graces. Uh, Galatians 5, uh, Romans 8, 13, if by the Spirit you put to death, that is of the body, you will live. And then in Galatians 5, 17, pinakita niya yung 
sari-saring kasalanan, pero kasunod ay ang sari-saring mga biyaya na bunga ng Espiritu. Anong pinapakita niya ron? Hindi mo magagapi ang kasalanan na hindi mo lilinangin, palalaguin ang kabaligtarang biyaya nito. The way to deal with sin, we have dealt with this in the first section of this long series, the way to deal with sin is cultivate the opposite grace. Kaya nga sa umpisa, tinignan natin yung mga opposites like uh, anger and patience, uh, this sin and that grace. And we, while never perfect, we can attain to a level of mortification of sins. There are sins that you can mortify. And as I've said last week, it's not just defeating sin in a particular encounter. We can all do that. But it is mortifying sin when that particular sin no longer harasses your thought. Yun ang mortified sin. Can we do that? Not in all sins, but in particular sins and particular focus, as we have seen last week, are your besetting sins. Diyan uh, na tayo maaaring maka-attain ng mortification. As it is capable of growth, so it is capable of decline, however. That's where fluctuation happens. Kung lumalago, pwede rin mangyaring uh, manghina, mag-decline. And that happens to many believers. So what we learn here is that mortification of sin and culti- cultivation of its opposite grace always go together. Meaning, displace by replacing. You cannot displace and leave it empty. You displace it by replacing it. Yun ang sinabi ni Paul Ephesians 4. Uh, sinabi niya na still no longer but work. Let no corrupt communication, but speak the truth. You see the point of displacing a sin by replacing it with a good grace, a good habit. Pinag-aralan din natin yan sa habit. But can we attain this? Yes, if by the help of the Holy Spirit, you use what is necessary, you do what is necessary, we can attain to victory over some sins that we need to mortify. And that also includes effective resistance to temptation. As Christians, we now have, if we resist, effective way of dealing with temptation. James 4, 7 is so clear. Submit to God, resist the devil, and take note what happens when we resist. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Therefore, the reason why the devil keeps on harassing us is because of either weak resistance or absent resistance. Ayaw nating labanan. At kadalasan, because of the profit or the pleasure of the sin, we are loath to, uh, to resist. And may sinabi din sa 1 Corinthians 10.13 that no temptation shall overtake us but what is common to man and he will provide a way of escape. Now you see, ang sinabi ron, when temptation overtakes, the problem for many Christians is they chase temptation. Pag overtake, ibig sabihin, Temptation is chasing you, and at a certain point, it may overtake you. But even then, it will not be unbearable. Pero pag ikaw na yung nag-chase ng temptation, ay ibang usapan yun, na dun ta- magiging talunan. So temptation will never stop, but we can resist and overcome. You need to believe this, brethren. And you may be dealing now with certain temptations that you find yourself often defeated, uh, you need to ask, am I resisting enough? And uh, resistance is a must for victory. No temptation is irresistible. That's the lie of the devil. Sabihin niya sa'yo, alam mo namang dyan ka mahina, eh, tanggapin mo na lang na mahina ka rin. Uh, wag, wag mo nang labanan, uh, tanggapin mo. Uh, hindi pwedeng... Go, dumating ka sa ganun. Uh, so, here, victory over temptation demands some 
painful discipline. Now, that's why we do not resist. Because it's not easy. It's going to be painful. So painful that Jesus uses a graphic figure to show how the painful resistance will mean. And he compares it to plucking out right eye and cutting off right hand. Now, the word he used imply, the words he used imply radical cutting off, radical plucking out. I mean, imagine someone cutting off his right hand uh, one inch muna. Uh, uh, so, uh, next time, add another inch and you see his hand dangling. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, that's yuck. Uh, but the point is, if you will have victory, cut it off, pluck it out. That means, in practical terms, if there is an occasion of sin that you need not, you need not be, don't be. Don't be there. If it is an occasion of sin to you. If meeting someone will become an occasion of sin to you, and meeting that someone is not a necessity, or you can do something else to avoid it, then avoid it. That's plucking out and cutting off. But sometimes it can be so pleasurable to be in the middle of temptation, and we're not ready to pluck out and cut off. So that's effective resistance that many fail to do because of the discipline involved. Then. There's the disciplined use of means of grace. Mahaba ang section natin sa means of grace. Because we studied individually the individual means of grace and then we studied the corporate means of grace. There are both individual and corporate means of grace. But here is how, after saying in verse 1, uh, remove malice and all these other sins, Peter then says, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. It's referring to the Word of God. Now, many are focused on the infant figure and they think it is referring to the immature Christian. No, the figure of the infant has to do with the analogy of desire. Yung infant na nagdi-desire ng kanyang mother's milk Ganun dapat ang desire ng bawat, bawat Kristiyano, bawat mana ng palataya ito, hindi lang yung mga baby Christian na tinatawag natin. Tumutuwa ito sa lahat ng Kristiyano na ang kanilang desire for the word and extend that to the other means of grace should be of such a, an intensity just like a baby longing for the mother's milk. So, Ganyan ang paggamit natin ng means of grace. So the means of grace are the external side of internal pursuit. If we pursue internally grace, graces, and holiness, but how do you put that in external form? Means of grace. You cannot say you are internally pursuing holiness and graces, and then you are neglectful of your prayer life, of your meditation time, of your uh, church life, and this many means of grace. Tingnan mo ang mga means of grace na ito ng mga pabuya at uh, kaloob ng Panginoon para tayo makapagwagi sa ating kabanalan. So triumph in holiness is through the ordinary use of the means of grace. Yung tuloy-tuloy and Ordinary. Ang ibig sabihin ko niya, do not resort to extraordinary measures to attempt a rushed victory. Baka isip, naku, sumusobra na yata ito. Mag-fasting muna ako. <laughs> so, nag-fasting. Uh, kala niya, by an extraordinary means, ay uh, makakapagwagi siya. Hindi. You have to do it uh, on a regular basis. Gaya ng ginagamit kong illustration, isipin mo ba, hindi ako kakain ng mula lunes hanggang sabado, pero kakain ako sa linggo ng equivalent ng pitong araw. <laughs> Mamamatay ka nun. Uh, hindi, hindi ganun ginawa ang katawan natin. 
ginawa ang katawan natin na regular intake. Ganon din sa spiritual life. Hindi ka pwede mag-rush o pag Sunday magpapaka, uh, magpapaka, I will immerse myself in the means of grace. And yet from Monday through Saturday, you're empty. Uh, you cannot do that. Do it that way. You cannot have a rushed victory on a Sunday and then back Monday, back to defeat again. Uh, no, you have to do it regularly in an ordinary way. So we looked at the victory on this, in this life, but then there is victory after this life. Ayon pag-usapan to ng iba, but that is part of what we have. Sinlessness is what we have, but not yet consummation when we die and as Christians or as righteous, we go to heaven. In heaven, we no longer have any proneness to sin. There is no more sinful nature. We are no longer simul justus et peccator. We're just justus. Uh, so they are called spirits of just men made perfect. That's the state of the righteous in the intermediate state. After death, before the second coming, we're in heaven, sinless, but not yet perfect, not yet consummated, I should say. Uh, while there is no more sin, it is not yet the fullness because we read in the book of Revelation of the souls in heaven crying out to God, O sovereign Lord, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood? Uh, that means that there is something that is not yet fulfilled. And even the souls in heaven are conscious of it. It's not yet the consummation. Uh, mahalaga ito, as I will point out, death remains an enemy as a result of sin, although overcome by Christ. Ang ibig sabihin niyan, in practical terms, the Christian hope is not equivalent to a death wish. Uh, baka ibig sabihin niya, no, wala nang kasalanan sa langit, sana kunin na lang ako ng Panginoon para wala nang kasalanan. Hindi, hindi yan ang hope natin. And do not equate your hope with death. Because death remains an evil. In fact, it is called in 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy that Christ will subjugate. So it's not a friend. And I hear many times Christians talking of death like something of a friend. And they call it the doorway to uh, sinlessness. No, uh, death is an evil, the result of sin. That's why death, even for believers, will mean grief and lamentation and loss. So, wag ka mag-death wish uh, kung may pinaglalabanan kang nahihirapan ka, hindi ka mataya ng solusyon doon. Uh, may mga par paraan para managumpay tayo sa buhay na ito. But uh, what we say is that in death, it is on the part of the living to say that he is now in the realm without sin. And that's a form of triumph. But now finally, there is the real hope. Perfection with consummation at the second coming. So, sa second coming ng Panginoon, as Peter says, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So, sa Intermediate, we're only in heaven. In the final state, it's heaven and earth. It becomes the whole creation of God becomes the dwelling place of believers. Now, I do not want to speculate beyond that. May mga nag speculate yung mga higher degree of holiness daw, heaven. Yung mga lower degree, earth. No, I don't believe that. It is for all believers to inherit the heaven and the earth, this time redeemed heaven and earth. And therefore, I can say, and as I often say, the final state, that is after the second coming of Christ, is like Eden, but so much more. But this time, there will be no more serpent to tempt. There will be no more sin. Uh, it will be heaven and earth for believers. And that is the blessed hope. It will have a bearing on the way of holiness now, even as we expect for that hope. Again, 
let us be clear, our hope is not death. Our hope is the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is called the blessed hope in Titus 2.13. But with that blessed hope, it bears on the way we live now, as John says in 1 John 3, 2 and 3. When he appears, second coming, we shall be like him. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself. That is now, even as he is pure. So you are pursuing purity now, though never perfectly, but you are doing it actively and seriously if you have your hope cast on the second coming of Christ. What does that mean by implication? Trying to be holy without a vision of eternity is a counterfeit holiness. You can't be. If all your vision and ambition is earthly and you have no place for eternity, you're striving after what Ecclesiastes calls chasing after the wind because it's under the sun. It's all under the sun. Now, you must admit that what I can achieve under the sun is just a limited form, though seriously, it's still triumph, but nothing like when Christ comes again. So, because the believer is made holy, triumphs may now be gained in application of this, both in this life and after this life. The victory of the believer is now both individual, you can individually gain the triumph in this life, but it also, and I use the connective and, the conjunction and, the to choice, it's not individual or corporate, it is individual and corporate. And Second Corinthians 7, 1 says, having therefore these promises, Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And it's put in the plural because it is meant to be corporate. And Apostle Paul follows that with his exhortation. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one, etc. So make room for the teachings that happen in the church. Because that's a vital and indispensable means of grace. So we must seek victory over our personal sins, but always in the context of the church. Those who hide behind the church and do not do battle against their own sins, they are not bound to experience the triumph. But those who do their battle in solitude, and not in the context of the church, they also are in a, uh, what they call a fool's errand. Uh, you're seeking for something that will never happen. So I appeal to you who may be claiming to be Christian, do you have a church where you do your battle not in solitude, but in the context of the local church, not just that you attend the church, but that you are part of the church in covenant terms, because victory or triumph is both individual and corporate. So what should be the right thought in this? Well, the right thought is knowing that Christ has won the victory already over sin and Satan, uh, I must own that in union with Him. So, tanggapin mo na yung tagumpay na meron ka kay Kristo, but that should, re that should result in the resolution, I will appropriate Christ's victory by triumphing over my own sins. It is by the Spirit with use of the means of grace. So, may kakayanan na ibinigay sa iyo ang Espiritu sa paggamit ng mga kasangkapan, makapananagumpay ka sa kasalanan. Ang maling pag-iisip, dala ng kasalanan ay isipin Christ's victory over sin is already complete. My continuing defeat does not diminish His victory. Theoretically, He is right. But His application is wrong. I should only claim the victory of Christ for me. I do not need to exert effort to for my own victory over sin. Now, that's wrong application. Precisely because Christ has 
already own the victory for you, you must live as a victor. You must live believing that you can fight against your sin. So my challenge to you is seek to grow in victory over Satan and sin without relaxing. There will never be a time when you can relax in this life. The rest, according to Revelation 14, 12, is for those who die in Christ. Then you would have earned your rest. This is not the time for rest as far as sin is concerned. So the fight continues. And my final exhortation here is the claim of the Apostle Paul. And take note, he claims this for believers because he uses we. He says, uh, you Romans and myself and by extension all Christians, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. So because Christ has already done something, uh, past tense, who loves us, he loved us by way of the cross. Now, present tense, we are experiencing conquest. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. That's the balance we need to maintain in our consideration of triumphs of holiness.